our first uh, presenters is going to be from a group titled Modified High Rail System. Um, this project was advised by Dr. John Dixon. Um, so what I'm going to ask is the first presenter to, out of the group to please go ahead and activate your video and introduce yourself and uh, go through your portion of the presentation. And then when the next person's prompt, make sure that you just de deactivate your video followed by the next person activating your video and introducing yourself and going through your presentation, your part of the presentation. So um, I will go ahead and uh, yield the mic to the first person presenting. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the final presentation for the 2019 to 2020 ENSCO Rail Capstone Design Project. First thing I want to do is introduce you to the team. My name is Joseph Ball, and I'm the team leader. I worked alongside Richard Beal, Brett LaFleur, Helen Lloyd, Brian Mock, Ben Poles, Sal Spinoza, and Jeff Sterling. Our faculty advisor was Dr. John Dixon. The representative from ENSCO Rail that we worked with was Ron Lang. Now that we've gotten a little bit of formality or familiarity with the team, let's talk about the project. The project is dealing with ENSCO's TGMS system. This is a track geometry measurement system that allows them to determine the track condition of rail. So this is a laser measurement system that can determine the three-dimensional position of the track in space. Alongside this program, they also have a series of cameras that can check for cracks. Between these two things, they can check for the track conditions and determine whether rail needs to be replaced or not. This can be mounted either to a high rail pickup truck, as shown on the right, or a full-size rail car. Our project was dealing with the high rail equipped pickup truck. Our project, the goal of which was to come up with a better way to accurately reproduce the forces that a rail car puts on rails using a high rail pickup truck, even though it's much lighter. This project, we needed to put a 2000 pound lateral force on the rails with the ability to measure the deflection of the rails and the force that we put on the rails causing such deflection. Primary application of this project, we use in rail yards. In rail yards, where they're a little tight on space, it will be very difficult to maneuver a full size rail car through all the small runs of track. This is where the high rail equipped pickup truck is very handy because it's easily maneuverable. And we want to be able to make that easily maneuverable pickup truck as accurate as possible for determining the track conditions and preventing derailment. So what I'm going to do now is turn it over to Richard Beale to talk a little bit more about why we chose that 2,000 pound. Hello there. My name is Richard Beale and I'll be talking about the driving factors behind this project. Train track rails are designed with a slope of 1 over 20 on the top surface of the head. Because of this slope, the downward force of the train cars results in a lateral force, which pushes the rails outward. The rail ties have become rotten or the screws have loosened enough. This um, could cause the rails to widen, which could cause the train to derail. Standard gauge for train rails is 56 and a half inches. And derailment will occur when the train rails widen to about 58 inches. Next, I'm going to discuss how we arrived at the 2,000 pound lateral force. The high rail truck that would be carrying this high rail system weighs about 10,000 pounds. Dividing the total weight by the four wheels results in 2,500 pounds of force per wheel in the vertical direction. Due to the slope of the rail, there will be about 125 pounds of force in the lateral direction. Compare this to a fully loaded coal car, which weighs about 143 tons, 286,000 pounds. After dividing the total weight by the eight wheels, there's almost 36,000 pounds of force from each wheel in the vertical direction. This translates into roughly 1,800 pounds of force in the lateral direction. Obviously, the weight of the high rail truck is not enough for a close approximation exerted by the lateral force of a coal car. This is where a 2,000 pound target force comes from. By exerting a 2,000 pound lateral force, the high rail system will take up any slack that exists in the rail system and show us where possible derail derailment locations could occur. I'm now going to pass it off to Brian Mock, and he's going to talk about um, high rail selection. Thanks, Richard. My name is Brian Mock, and I will be talking about which high rail system we decided to use and why. After our initial research, we found that there are only three main companies that produce high rail systems, 
these being Harsco, DMF, and Rathno. We needed to select a high rail system that was compatible with ENSCO's truck, cost effective, and easy to modify. After comparing different systems made by each company, we narrowed our search down to the DMF 1015 and 1016 designs. The 1016 system is one of DMF's newer models with some extra gadgets like a track geometry system built in. However, due to its updated design, the concept that we generated would put a bending moment on the axle and create extra stress in the system. The 1016 was also priced at $10,000, a very large investment for this kind of project. On the other hand, the 1015 system was almost exactly what we were looking for. It is a round hollow axle that would be convenient for easier modifications. The concept we selected put the hydraulic cylinder in line with the wheels, thus essentially eliminating any kind of bending on the axle. The only problem we had was availability. DMF had discontinued the 1015 model to promote the 1016, but fortunately they had spare parts in stock. This axle also ended up being more than three times cheaper than the 1016 model, giving us exactly what we needed while also being cost effective. Now I'm gonna pass it off to Cullen to talk more about our concept design. Thank you, Brian. Good evening, everyone. My name is Colin Lloyd, and I'll be discussing our modified axle design. Pictured here is the as shipped DMF 1015 front axle assembly that our team selected to start our design with. On the left, you can see an exploded view of the axle as shipped from the manufacturer. On the right, you can see our final design with our modified axle parts, as well as the new parts that our project required. The cream colored part in the middle is our new enlarged axle. This larger axle section is required to accommodate the hydraulic cylinder, which applies the 2,000 pound force. The enlarged axle has an inside diameter of 3.75 inches, while the existing axle, shown in red, has an inside diameter of 2.25 inches. The red axle on the left is our modified short axle with a flange welded onto its end. Eight 3 8 inch bolts will be used to attach the modified short axle to the hydraulic cylinder and the enlarged axle. This size flange was selected to accommodate a 4.9 inch bolt circle so that the 3 8 inch bolts or accompanying nuts don't interfere with the enlarged axle or short axle. This sandwich of three flanges forms a connection that our team has termed the flange switch. This flange switch and middle cylinder design was selected to make sure the flanges and bolts don't interfere with the mounting brackets from the axle assembly to the truck. And the top image on the right side of the enlarged axle is the modified axle, which houses the guide rod and the spindle. Inside this modified axle is the guide rod, which is shown in the bottom picture here in gray. The guide rod connects to the piston of the hydraulic cylinder, shown in brown, via a threaded male-female connection. The guide rod will be machined with a threaded female portion to mount to the piston of the hydraulic cylinder. The piston of the hydraulic cylinder will be threaded from Parker Hannifin, extending out towards one of the wheels. Past the guide rod, we have the spindle and the wheel connection, which Sal will go on to describe. Thank you, Colin. My name is Sal Spinoza, and I'm going to be talking about the rest of our design change, two parts in particular, the guide rod, which Colin mentioned half of, and the spindle. First, the guide rod. The purpose of it is to transport the force from the hydraulic cylinder to the spindle. The big thing to notice is that you can see that the end is tapered. This is because as the guide rod moves, there's an interference by some of our guiding bolts. So the end has a slight taper to it, which fixed the problem due to the small range of movement needed. Next, just like the other side, the connection is a threaded connection. But one problem was that there was no way to perfectly line up the spindle based on a random thread. So after brainstorming with the subgroup, we decided to bore a hole into the spindle that was farther than we needed and use a stop nut to be able to line up exactly where we needed it as seen in the top picture. Next, the spindle. This was probably the most important part of our project because the spindle holds the entire wheel assembly and attaches it to the axle. Applying the force to the spindle allows us to push the entire wheel assembly as one instead of putting too much force on one piece. Although a few, a few changes need to be made with the spindle first. The connection to the axle was a perfect fit that was held together by an adhesive. Once we were able to pry the spindle out of the axle on disassembly, 
we cleaned off the adhesive on both the spindle and the axle, and it made a perfect fit in the axle that was able to slide when the force was applied. Next, we added a slot in the spindle, which you, as you can see in the top picture is the top gray piece. And it was cut all the way until the end. This was for the two blue bolts seen as the bottom picture, which, are hold, which help guide the spindle laterally while making sure there's no rotational movement. Lastly, I'm going to talk about a few changes we made to the axle for the bolts as well. Two holes were cut through the axle and a boss was added on to give the bolts more structure to be threaded on. Now I'm going to pass it to Jeff to talk about our hydraulic cylinder. Thank you, Sal. My name is Jeff Sterling, and today I'm going to be talking to you about the hydraulic cylinder system and how we decided on what we were going to use. So for this project, as Richard said earlier, we needed to produce at least 2,000 pound force is what we decided with our sponsor, Ron, in order to best simulate the rail car and to get the most accurate results. And we would have to hold this force. So when we were looking for cylinders, we were looking for a certain size that we could use with a certain pressure in order to produce that force. So we also needed to find an axle that was small enough to fit either inside the axle tube or fit inside of a slightly modified axle tube without enlarging the size of the tube too much due to interference possible on the truck. Now, one of the other key factors was trying to mount this cylinder radially in line with the center of the axle so that we could have pure axial forces, no bending moments or no torsions. So one of the things we ended up finding was Parker Hannafin MMB round line hydraulic cylinder. This cylinder came configured from Parker Hannafin customly with a round cap flange. This cap flange has eight bolt holes that we are going to use to attach this flange to the flange, which as Colin said, and uh, this ensures that this cylinder is radially aligned and that the, the force of the guide rod is going directly to the center of the spindle, which then allows our force to be true and you know not cause any material stresses or failure. Um, also, we wanted to have a threaded piston connection to ensure that the guide rod manufacturing and assembly would be as simple as possible. So just to give you guys some frame of reference, this cylinder is about a little under 15 inches long from end to end. And the bore diameter is about 1 7 16 actually is what the bore diameter is. So and the external diameter, as Colin said, is 3.75. So this cylinder will, in will increase the force on the rail. And yeah, so a little bit more about the application of this cylinder. It's a double acting cylinder, which means that we can apply pressure to it in order to retract it or extend it, which will be helpful in pulling the axle back together after inspection use and going back on the highway. Also, we determined that this hydraulic cylinder would best be placed right near the center of the axle, where we would have easy access between the truck mounting to the high gear, to the high rail gear system. And as you can see in yellow, and as Colin talked about before, we needed to increase the diameter of the tube and we did this because this cylinder was something that was really, really useful for this design. And we just we determined that the this had the features that were most most important to what we were trying to accomplish with our design. Um, as Sal said, we cleaned off the spindle, which allows this force to slide the spindle smoothly through the axle tube, preventing any sort of material malfunctions or or um, fractures or anything. So. Yeah, now I'm going to pass it off to Ben, and he's going to talk about the data collection and the sensors. Good evening. While our main goal for this project was to accomplish the task of applying the load to the rails, data would also need to be collected from this unit. The two data sets needed to be collected are the force applied to the rail and the resulting deflection of the rail. To measure the force applied, we plan to measure the hydraulic pressure in the cylinder and by multiplying the hydraulic pressure by the area of the piston, we will result in the force that is exerted by the cylinder. And to measure the deflection of the rails, we plan to rather measure the extension of the axle as seen in the graphic in the bottom right. 
Uh, for measuring the hydraulic pressure, uh, some of the requirements that we determined were that we wanted it to be able to measure pressures up to and over 1,000 PSI, and we want it to be accurate within 1%. And uh, we determined to recommend this hydraulic pressure transducer. It is a readily available part that satisfies both our accuracy and range requirements. We explored multiple options for measuring the extension of the axle to recommend to future groups. We determined that the sensor should be accurate to within a tenth of an inch and have range capabilities of four inches or greater. The first sensor type that we considered is a rack and pinion encoder. We would put the rack on the axle and the encoder would be attached to the spindle. And as the spindle moved in and out from the axle, the encoder would roll over the rack and give us a deflection measurement. Another sensor we considered was the optical distance sensor. This is a laser type sensor that would be mounted to the bottom of the axle and pointed directly at the wheel. And this way we would be available to measure the extension right at the wheel. Uh, the third sensor that we considered is a linear magnetic encoder. And this works similarly to the rack and pinion encoder but rather than a mechanical interface between a rack and a pinion, it uses a magnetic interface between a magnetic tape strip and the sensor. We would uh, incorporate this by uh, placing the tape on the guide rod and the encoder would be mounted to the inside of the axle. And this would benefit us by being able to incorporate the sensor inside the axle where it is safe and would lead to a sleeker design. While unable to create a working prototype to test, we were able to analyze the stresses in our design during the design process. Here we have a comparison of the wheel with only the, the loading of the truck on the left, and on the right we have the wheel with the addition of the 2,000 pound lateral force. The max stress in the wheel with the lateral force is around 13,000 PSI, which is well below the 40,000 PSI yield limit of steel and only a small margin larger than the estimated 10,000 PSI without the cylinder being actuated. And now Brett will continue talking about the FEA. Thank you, Ben. Like you said, I'm Brett LaFoon, and I'm going to be talking about the rest of the, of the FEA and the financial report. I was the lead on the FEA portion of the project, and my main focus when studying the FEA was from spindle to spindle. This consisted of the axle, spindle, hydraulic cylinder, and guide rod. Starting with the axle, uh, we decided to compare the original axle with no lateral force to the final modified axle with the lateral force. As you can see, the stress plots look very similar to one another. The singularity point is where the axle is mounted to the truck and the stress begins to stem off these points towards the spindle. We do not expect the original axle to fail because ENSCO has used this exact model before for testing railroads and did not have any major issues. Since the stress plots look similar, we do not expect the modified axle to fail when adding the center axle with the applying lateral force. Now, looking at the internal components of our system, the hydraulic cylinder, spindle, and guide rod. The stress points on the spindle are where it's pushed up against the wheel and the stress points on the guide rod are on the smaller end where it will be inserted into the spindle. All these stress points are under 15,000 PSI, which is well below the yield strength of steel. This gives us a factor of safety around 2.7 from yielding. Uh, since the factor of safety is that high, we do not expect the internal components to fail. Now, shifting our focus to finances, I was in charge, in charge of creating our financial report. The financial report only consisted of items that were ordered before leaving campus. Starting with the sensitivity chart, the high rail system dominates percent costs with 64%, and the hydraulic cylinder also takes a chunk out of our percent costs with 33.2%. The rest of the project combined to be below 3%. This shows how vital the high rail system 
and the hydraulic cylinder were to the project. Now, looking at the Pareto chart, the hydraulic system cost $3,420 and the hydraulic cylinder cost $1,775. Again, this shows how important these items were to the project because the rest of the components combined to be less than $150. Now, I'm going to pass it to Joe to conclude this presentation. Thanks, Brett. What I want to do now is talk a little bit about the next steps. Now, because of the pandemic that's been going on in the world lately, and us having to leave campus, we weren't able to complete the project. The first step that would be required in order to complete the project would be the final assembly of the prototype. Now, several components did not arrive prior to us departing campus. This would be the enlarged axle tube, the hydraulic cylinder, and a few other small things that we might run into along the way. Some final machining was also still required. This would be the main axle tube that is not the enlarged tube, needs to be cut and have the flanges welded on, as well as the guide rod, which needs threading on one end of it still. Once the final assembly and all the machining was done and the prototype was finally assembled, we would move into testing of the prototype. Now, our plan for testing would be to get a short section of rails to mount the system on. Once mounting the system on the rails, we would activate it using a hydraulic pump. We would test for leaks, binding, design flaws, part failures, things of that nature. And assuming it passed all these tests, we would release it for use with Pensco to be used in their track testing hopefully get higher accuracy than they can right now. Before we move on to questions, I want to give a special thanks to all the guys in the group who did a great job throughout the year, and even more special thanks to our uh, representative from ENSCO, Ron Lang. Without their funding, we would not be able to complete the prototype. We would not be able to order some of the more expensive parts, and it was a great uh, experience to be able to have him work alongside us and give us some insight into the industry. Thank you all for attending. Do you have any questions? Great. You guys did a great job on the presentation. Thank you. So now we're going to move into a time of questions. If anybody has any questions, if you could just please indicate in the chat that you do, or if you are um, joining um, through a browser, you may go ahead and just um, interject and activate your microphone. I do see one question um, that wants to be at, that Dr. Allison would like to ask. So Dr. Allison, go ahead. <coughs> Yeah, the, on the wheel, it contacts the rail some distance away from the center of the axle. And when we, you apply that 2,000 pound force, that will generate a bending moment on the axle. Um, did you take a look at that? And I wonder how significant that that bending moment would be in terms of uh, affecting the stress. Yeah, so we did take a look at that. And I'm going to hand that off to either Brett or Ben, who did the FEA, to talk a little bit more about um, why we believe that it won't pose an issue. I can take that. Uh, we actually did incorporate the bending moment into our analysis, so that was included in those some of those charts. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Allison, for that question. Any other questions? I'd like to uh, pose one. So as all the other projects were, this project also was cut short due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, are there any plans for this project to continue? Um, past this point that you know of? Yeah, so we have heard talk. Um, we're not entirely sure 100%, but there's a possibility of extending the project to next year's seniors and maybe adding more to the scope of it, uh, maybe more in-depth with sensors or things of that nature. But to answer your question, we're not 100% sure. Yeah, uh, Ron Lang for Mansco here. Can uh, can you guys hear me over the computer? We can hear yes. you, Ron. Yeah. Uh, indeed, uh, Ensco is very pleased with uh, the progress on the project. Uh, we're very saddened that it's uh, that it got cut short. 
and we're happy to continue sponsoring a project next year. So uh, the answer is yes. Yes, Ron and I have been discussing the details. This is uh, Dr. Dixon speaking. And so we are, we are hoping to do that coming this fall. Great, well, thank you. Any other questions from anybody in this channel? Um, again, this is Dr. Dixon. Just a quick comment. I'm just really proud of these guys. They did a lot of really hard, worked really hard and just did a, did a lot of really quality work. So, so uh, well done, guys. Good job. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Dixon. Thank you, Dr. Dixon. And hey, thanks, Dr. Dixon. Thank you, Ron. Thanks also, Ron. Thanks, guys. Well, thank you. Well done.